I'm Dr. Lisa Yezik, and I am a Regents Professor of Science Fiction Studies at Georgia Tech. One of the things that I do in my research is that I look at science fiction as a global phenomena and the really uh, most important way that we can tell each other stories about science and technology and society and the way we can share those stories with each other across centuries, continents, and cultures. Now, within that broad research agenda, one of the things I'm really interested in is the recovery of lost voices and the discovery of new ones. And I'm going to draw on some of that work today to talk to you about three traditions of women's solar punk speculation. All right. Now, when we're talking about solar punk, we're going to be looking at stories about what the future might look like if humanity began to resolve environmental issues by shifting to renewable energy sources. This is a kind of science fiction that got really popular about 10 years ago, and it's something that's very much still uh, in the air today. Now, one of the things we're going to find is that no matter where we find solar punk stories coming from, um, when women write them, consistently we're going to find a link between thinking through the kinds of environmental sciences we need to heal the earth and thinking through the kinds of social justice issues we need to pursue to heal the social body or the body politic as well. So even though we tend to think of solar punk as a new phenomena beginning around 2010, I would argue that it's actually at least a centuries old tradition and that it begins in Southeast Asia with Bengali feminist Rakea Hussain, who wrote that 1905 short story, Sultana's Dream. Now Sultana's Dream directly connects issues of science to issues of social justice through its vision of a utopian garden mega city created by emancipated female scientists who harness the power of the sun to do everything from uh, weather control to military protection. Today, solar punk stories by South and East Asian women tend to connect the future-oriented garden city to multi-species justice. And we see this particularly in the work of award-winning Indian fantasy author Shweta Taneja and Chinese Singaporean author Joyce Cheng. Both of these authors and many other wonderful women writers can be found in Christoph Ruprecht's multi-species cities. Uh, Solar Punk Urban Futures, and that's by World Weaver Press, which is a leader in publishing environmental science fictions from across the globe. The next region I want to explore is Africa, and we see uh, a lot of women who are writing environmental science fiction across Africa grappling with the environmental legacy of colonialism. And what we'll find in African solar punk stories is a tendency to replace the Western opposition of nature and infrastructure with more complicated stories of better futures that are based on fostering connections between those two seemingly opposed things. Now, the stories that are written in this vein can take a wide variety of stances from the dystopian to the more utopian. At the more dystopian end, we have Kenyan filmmaker Wanuri Kahiyu's short film Pumzi, which very much warns of the dangers of attempting to continue to hold nature and infrastructure apart, as well as the more utopian uh, imaginings in the cyberpunk novels of Nigerian-American author Nanadi Okorafor and South African author Lauren Bukes. Finally, I want to suggest a third marvelous locus of solar punk speculation, indigenous science fiction, especially I'm thinking about North American indigenous science fiction. What we're going to find is that indigenous science fiction authors tend to approach climate change through the lens of their historic experiences with colonial settler violence. And because of that, you're going to see that these stories tend to refuse Western generated narratives of total destruction and apocalypse, instead celebrating collective continuance, especially as it's found in the enduring connections between ancestors and descendants. Again, this is a type of speculation that we've seen in commercial science fiction since at least the beginning of the 20th century. One of the earliest stories that I found in this vein is by pioneering science fiction writer Lilith Lorraine, who was very proud of her indigenous, Latinx, and European ancestry. So as early as 1930, Lorraine was imagining a future Corpus Christi where um, 
actually where our ancestors travel forward to us and they see all of the marvelous things that we've done, including creating multi-species cities that, that embrace a multiracial population. Today, one of the most exciting indigenous authors in this vein is O.K. Owinga Pueblo author, Rebecca Roanhorse, whose Trail of Lightning is a marvelous exploration of what would happen uh, should an apocalypse wipe away most of Western civilization, thereby giving North America back to the indigenous people who were there before Westerners got there. Finally, a really important uh, speculative fiction that all of you should know about is Irish Anishinaabe Metis artist Elizabeth Lepense's game Thunderbird Strike, which is a side scroller where you play a mythical being that gathers um, lightning bolts to defend Turtle Island um, from oil pipeline activities. And so you get to hurl down your lightning bolts, blowing up pipeline technologies while resurrecting the animals and peoples who were killed by those activities. It's an exciting game that led Fox News to declare Le Pense a public enemy of the American people. And I can say, I can only hope that you all will be inspired to design games that will get so much good attention, right? And can get into so much good trouble. Finally, if you want to continue exploring alternate visions of energy futures that are especially in this fairly optimistic solar punk vein, I've got a whole list here of other books that I just didn't have time to talk about. And one thing I'd want to call your attention to is that many of these authors, in addition to uh, claiming either Black or Indigenous or some other kind of um, non-Western ancestry, are often also LGBTQ plus authors. And so really approaching this from a nuanced and complex perspective. Okay, I know I have said more than enough by now, and so I'm going to let you go. Hit me up if you have any questions and otherwise, happy reading.